Well, uh, greetings. Uh, it's 3 p.m. Wednesday. It's time for our class. As I mentioned that on the bulletin board. Um, so let's, uh, it's uh, the day today is May 15, 2024. And this is the class for Church History 1, or as the uh, mentioned in the seminary syllabus, HI 104, Church History number 1, for Mod 5, uh, the year 2024. Uh, let's start our time with a prayer. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, to again study of your work throughout history, church history, and history is in general, in uh, its totality, is your story and the story of your work in the world to redeem people. And uh, it's a story of the advancement of your gospel, advancement of your church. May we uh, be faithful in the studying of your uh, work throughout human history and a study of your word. Help us to learn from our past so that we will not repeat the same mistake. And uh, also we learn from the good examples of our heritage to implement them in our times. I ask you, Lord, to bless all these dear students, themselves, their family, their children, bless them in their ministry, Bless them in this course and any other classes that you are taking. May they do excellent for your glory. We pray all these things in your name, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. For without you, we can do nothing. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Oh, great. Hi, how are you? Good to have you. Um, I was just going to go over the syllabus and... Uh, and also answer your questions. If you have any question, I'd be more than glad to answer. And just go over some of the main things. I will go over the PowerPoint and the things that I think are interesting to discuss more. I will uh, emphasize on them, but I'm not going to uh, repeat the same lecture because there's no point of doing that. All right, so let's go to our... So first of all, let me go to share screen. So, okay. Okay, as I mentioned, uh, this is the church history of one, HI 104, uh, starting today as uh, starting from Mod 5, which started on Monday, May 13. And we will go all the way to the end of month of June. Uh, we have these meetings three to six for me to answer your questions or to emphasize some major issues that are interesting to have a discussion with you or answer your questions. Um, our plan is, Lord's willing, we want to study a history of Christianity from Pentecost up to Reformation. Uh, from Reformation to the present time will be part of the next course in Mod 6. And we want to analyze doctrinal institutional development of the church and uh, the impact of that on theological thinking. We want to discuss uh, the development of uh, church doctrines. If you have questions anytime, please you feel free to stop me and ask your question. Uh, and here there are some information about me. You can read that yourself. Our textbooks, beside the Word of God, it's the, as you have seen it, it's this book, uh, Christianity Throughout Centuries uh, by Earl uh, Kearns. It's a very good book, um, both clear and uh, easy to read and also deep scholarly work we want to uh, we will go through that if you take both courses we will cover all of the chapters uh, if you only taking this class you will go through uh, chapter 25 end of chapter 25 the second book which is 
unfortunately been out of print unless some of you guys were able to find it on eBay is this book, uh, Our Legacy. But I have uploaded the chapters uh, on the lessons, uh, the lesson tabs. But if you were able to find a copy of that, I encourage you to get it. It's a very good book to have. Uh, uh, for it, it surveyed the development of uh, uh, doctrines of Christianity from evangelical perspective. And that's by Dr. Hannah, uh, who uh, is a church history uh, prof at uh, Dallas Theological Seminary. There are some additional textbooks that I mentioned here. Some of them I want to focus on them. Um, one of them, as you see, the first one, I I recommend, I, I highly recommend these books. You might be interested to have them for further study. It's a, a very good book is this one, Documents of Christian Faith. Documents of the Christian Faith, uh, published by Oxford University Press. It's an excellent book because it gives you, uh, it's it's uh, uh, selective documents. What it it what I enjoy about reading about this book and using it is it gives you can see the historical evidences of our Christian faith. For example, one of the excellent one is right in the beginning when you open you start reading these documents. Uh, the second document is by a uh, Roman uh, uh, representative from uh, Nero and is Tactius, uh, and he's reporting to Nero about the events in Israel and Palestine. And he talks about, you know, he says that there was a man named here, uh, Jesus, known as uh, Christos, that we have crucified him uh, under Pontius Pilate. And then, uh, but his um, people also believe that he has risen from the dead and he had some great majestic powers. So, you know, he's a he's an unbeliever. He's a pagan Roman agent, but he is testifying to the truth of death and resurrection of Christ. He's testifying to a uh, miraculous power of Christ uh, and it's fantastic. It's fantastic. And many other documents you can find um, in this book. I highly recommend it. Uh, the documents of early church. Another one that I recommend is a, it's a textbook that I had when I was at, when I was at seminary at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School in Chicago. Uh, this book by, it's Erzman Handbook of History of Christianity. Uh, uh, the editor is Tim Dowley, and it's a it's a very easy uh, easy book to read, and is written in a way like you enjoy it, as if you're reading a storybook. Really, the story of Christianity, and uh, he highlights the figures, the events. Uh, again, if you wanted to further study or research about Christianity, I recommend that. Um, there are these two other, I mean, there are two volumes. Uh, uh, I don't have them with me right now. There, I have them at my home library. Uh, Church History Volume 1 and Church History Volume 2 uh, by, first one is by Everett Ferguson. The second one is by John Woodbridge. John Woodbridge was my uh, church history prof at Trinity, uh, excellent man, wonderful, godly man. And I, these are, we use these two textbooks at the graduate level here at our seminary for our church history. Um, fantastic book I recommend is uh, Bruce Shelley, Church History in Plain Language. And one, one an interesting thing about this book, I highly recommend that, you can buy the audio. Uh, of course, there are so many different format that you can buy it. I have them as a, on a CD, actually MP3. And uh, I listen to them every so often when I'm driving. So you can use your driving time uh, 
or um, uh, learning about church history. And again, he, uh, Bruce Shelley has a very um, kind of clear writing, easy to read. You can continue and um, uh, read. It's very, it's nice to listen to the audio format, and it's also very nice to read the book. And he brings out issues and perspective that you don't find them in other uh, uh, church history books. Another book, uh, let me see. Uh, there is Robert uh, Walton, the Ch Charts of Church History. That's very good. Again, another book by my old prof, Dr. Woodbridge. Uh, and he was a general editor, the leaders of the Christian church by Moody Press. That's a, almost like a devotional book. Uh, you read about the lives of these godly men and women and uh, their example, and you can become encouraged by their commitment and uh, the sacrifices that they made uh, for the cause of the Church of Christ. Another book that I'm surprised I didn't put it there, I should add that, it's this book by, it's called Oxford, uh, uh, the Con Concise Dictionary of Christian Church, Oxford Concise Dictionary of Christian Church. It's a wonderful reference book. It's very accurate. Again, it's not written by, from evangelical perspective, but it's very accurate. Uh, it's a good mm, um, resource book to have. It just concise dictionary. I highly recommend. Another one, again, I need to add that also to update this list. You know, when we study church history, um, almost all the books that I know are we are basically following uh, the history of the Catholic Church. Uh, up to uh, the 16th century when the Protestant movement starts. Um, uh, but, and you, you get the impression that there was nothing else except what the Catholic Church was doing. But there's this book by E.H. Uh, Broadbent, uh, The Pilgrim Church. Uh, and it's a short book, uh, but small print that makes it a little bit difficult to read. And he focuses on uh, churches and movements uh, uh, in the centuries before Reformation that were they were faithful to the word of God and they were faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ, separate and they were separate. They were not part of the uh, Roman Catholic Church. Okay. Any questions so far? Are you okay? All right. So we want to see movement of God in history, that these are our objective. We want to understand how we receive the New Testament. Uh, we want to understand different various form of church government and have a clear uh, understanding of the origin of various denomination that we have today. Um, we want to understand the dangerous trends uh, in the church history to avoid them and also learn from the positive examples uh, and to follow them. And we want to see the church of God and the work of God in different historical periods and again, gain encouragement and instruction from our ancestor, spiritual ancestor. Um, we want to see the uh, correlation between the scriptures and what the church has come to believe uh, and to understand where the church is uh, right now, uh, historically and also as far as the scriptures is concerned. Uh, and to gain a better and deeper appreciation for the organism which God has used the church the body of Christ to uh, manifest his glory and his truth throughout the world. 
The way we will have these courses, as I mentioned, these classes is the lectures are already recorded, the PowerPoint lessons, everything is uploaded. Uh, so you're expected to participate in the discussion board on the Populi. Uh, the lectures are there, you can watch them. And if you have any questions, feel free to contact me or these times are for the time that you may have question. And outside these times, if you have questions, please feel free to either email me, text me. I put my number uh, there also that you can use, you can contact if you have any question. There will be weekly quizzes uh, to encourage you to study and evaluate your preparation. Uh, there will be the five summary and evaluation paper of the uh, our legacy, the book, Our Legacy, History of Church Doctrines. They will be a term paper. Um, I encourage you to, uh, I, in the, I mentioned in the syllabus, to send me a detailed outline of your term paper by the sixth session. But I encourage you to do it, start doing it, working on it even from now, uh, so that I can see your um, uh, outline, I approve it, and you can start working on that. Of course, you can, your outline can change, uh, but I encourage you to start working on that uh, as soon as you can. Uh, it will save you lots of uh, headaches. And there, there's a midterm exam to crystallize what you have learned. Um, they are, there, there may be videos uh, that I will upload on Populi, and there's also final exam. Um, the midterm exam, on, uh, we will talk about that, goes from session one to, se to session four. The final goes from uh, se session, I think, yeah, yeah, it goes from, let me double check. It goes from session, uh, so the midterm covers, the, uh, the, uh, the, yeah, the final exam is whatever after the midterm, so it's not comprehensive. Um, um, so you need to attend, and I know a number of you, all, all of you guys are online, so the way I will check your attendance is through your participation in the discussion board. Please, in the discussion board, respond to uh, at least two other posts by the students. I will make that, uh, I will post that on the bulletin board. And um, so I want you to interact with one another and um, you should be able to access Populi on your email account, participate in the Populi discussion. Um, Okay, then the summary evaluation papers are based upon chapters of the book of our, our legacy. Each paper should be at least three pages. If it's more than that, it's okay, but at least three pages. Uh, following Trubian format, uh, please have you know three papers and I want uh, these parts. A summary of the chapters, their strength, their weaknesses, and what you have learned from these chapters that can help you, that can impact your ministry. So uh, a summary, the weaknesses, the strength, and uh, what you learn from what you are reading that can uh, be implemented into your ministry. Uh, at the end of the course, by the end of week number seven, there is a, a required reading the, the sign-up sheet, uh, you just write down how many pages you read and sign it, and you can, uh, I believe you can upload that through Populi. As I mentioned, there, is, there are weekly quizzes, and for each weekly quiz, the study guide will be provided, and, and uh, I, you know, what I recommend, as I mentioned in the bulletin board, uh, first, uh, read the study guide, then read the, the textbook carefully, 
then uh, read your, go over the PowerPoint and then answer the question on the study guide. You can bring that sheet, that study guide sheet with yourself when you're taking the quiz. The thing I don't want you to do is copy and paste. Uh, please don't do copy and paste, but you can use that study guide um, uh, during uh, in your as you're taking the uh, the quizzes, and also in the midterm exam, there will be a study guide for quizzes for the midterm and also for the fi final. Uh, number eight, you know, this quick, is quick question, Professor. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there. No, no, that's okay. Um, in regards to the quizzes and the midterms, um, are those timed or are, are they not timed? Yeah, they are timed, but I I assure you, you have enough time. If you do the, if you go through this procedure that I'm mentioning, reading the study guides, uh, reading your textbook PowerPoint and answering them, you don't, you will not have any uh, problem with the time limits. Okay, thank you. Okay, sure. Um, okay, this number eight is the one that I mentioned about uh, the paper. I said, you know, by week six, send me a sheet of a detailed outline of your paper, you know, major points, sub points. But if you can do that sooner than week number, week six, it would be uh, more easier for you because I can go over it, check it, uh, edit it, and then send it back to you, and you can continue to work on your paper. And then there's a term paper by the end of the course, 10-page paper using Trubian format, and at least uh, four sources. You can choose one of these to uh, four topics, one of these actually five topics. Uh, the process of canonicity of the Bible, uh, the attempts of the Catholic Church for etern in in internal reform, the impact of Augustine on uh, Christian theology, and Christological controversy, and the Council of Chalcedon. That's where the uh, the the Church really uh, crystallized its view about the nature of Christ. And what were the differences and causes of separation between churches of East and the West? Uh, as you know, if you go to a school website or popularly, there are help for writing papers, Trubian format, you know, templates and all that. Um, the final exam will cover sessions five, six, and seven. And that would be at the seventh week, and you can uh, you do it online and just submit it by the Sunday before the midnight of that week. Any questions this part so far? No, no, no questions. I appreciate all the information. I was actually going, um, I had uh, listened to a little bit of the other lecture that you had posted. Oh, so sure. A lot of this is... Um, is is repetitive, which is good because I'm I'm getting the uh, oh, again. So thank you. Good, good, good. Okay, and one thing that our librarian has done great help, she has made this site. If you go there, you can f just uh, go to your Popoli, click on the library help, click on lib guides and uh, biblical studies. You can go to this site, and you have number of resources she has put a number of resources uh, to, to help you to write your papers um okay. yeah okay i actually do have one question I, um i was going to ask um regarding the reading logs um it looks like it's on page eight i believe of yeah. the syllabus yeah yeah um so i'm just trying to understand so we have to do a reading log for every time that we read every week or no 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 or... just no no at the end of the course i just uh fill out that sheet that you know i have read this book from no no that's for the whole for, for the whole module oh i got you okay okay makes sense okay oh. thank you sure and uh then here's our here's the syllabus that i think it's clear we go all the way and here are the 
uh, student evaluation, grade scales, uh, and that's it. Any questions regarding the syllabus? Um, just one last thing, and I'm sorry I'm asking so many questions. No I just problem. Want to make sure. Feel free. Uh, discussion board. So it's it's my understanding. For basically, everything's due at by Sunday at midnight, right? Uh, discussion yes. board, everything that that includes our initial post and the two responses. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, everything uh, is due before the midnight of the Sunday of that week. I okay. Didn't Thank you. The word count in the discussion board. I'm sorry. I didn't notice a word count in the discussion board. Is there a word count that you'd like? Um, no, no, no. I, uh, For me, uh, the more important than the word count is the quality of the content of your discussion. Uh, I, I focus on that. No, there's no word count. Okay. Anything else? All right, then... Um, as I mentioned, let me just stop share. As I mentioned, because uh, the lectures are recorded and uh, you notice, uh, you know, if I <laughs> if I want to go over there, it would be repetitive. So I'm not going to repeat the lectures. Uh, I'm just going to go over the PowerPoint and focus on some of the things that I, I find them to be interesting or some of the things that you find them to be interesting and you like to discuss. Um, so let me go to another share screen. Okay. Okay, how do I, why doesn't this, oh, okay. Yeah, one moment. Okay, all right. And I always want to uh, recognize and remember Dr. Sam Burton. He was the, he passed away, I think it was last year. And for many, many years, he used to be the uh, church history for the undergraduates at the school. So I want to honor his memory. Um, so uh, we want to study church history. You can look at that. Mm, you know, you know why uh, we have interest in church history because Christian faith is a story of God, uh, God's working throughout history. I mean, uh, God became a man, lived among us in time and space. So uh, history is very important in Christian faith. In fact, you know, I teach the world religion course and also teach Islamic studies a class. Uh, I can tell you Christianity among all these so-called world religion is the only one that has uh, roots in history. And we deal with history. The, the other religions, you know, you just have to, I mean, of course, for example, in Islam uh, or Judaism, we have a number of historical events, or even in Buddhism, a Far Eastern religion. But... Um, uh, you don't have uh, things such as development of doctrines throughout church history, through their um, these uh, other religion history. Um, church history is very unique. History is very unique for Christian faith because it's the truth of God interacting with human uh, nature, with human situation which you don't find that in uh, other so-called religions. Um, now, the thing that is interesting regarding church history to remember, uh, church history there, it has some elements. There are four important elements. We focus on events, what has happened, and then in order to know what has happened, we need to have information. We gain this information through archeology, span through ancient documents, textual criticism, study of texts, archaeology, art, art, uh, artifacts, um, or, you know, if we come to the uh, closer to our time through interview with the people who are alive. So there's a incident, there's information, then there's an inquiry, you, the process of research, 
uh, you know, there are all these kind of documents there, but they are not accurate. So you have to find the truthfulness, the authenticity of these information. And then when you did all of that, then you have to uh, bring the meaning to this information. So that comes the part of interpretation. So we have four eyes, incident, information, inquiry, and interpretation. So if you want to define church history, church history, it's the number one interpreted record of the origin, process, and impact of Christianity on human history based upon organized data. You know, we do that interpretation based on organized data, which these data gathered by scientific method of uh, from archaeological study, documentary, uh, or living sources. So if you want to compare this definition with these elements, uh, it starts with the last one. Uh, church history, it's the interpretation of the Christian faith, its impact on human history. But how do we do that? Uh, we get data, data that are organized. And how we get these day organized data is through research, through uh, documents, archaeology, or living sources. Okay. And uh, so it's, it's the interpreted organized story of the redemption of mankind on earth. Now, when we, when you do church history, there are different um, uh, methods. There are different uh, elements of church history. One is scientific. So you just study archaeology, you study texts, you do literary criticism to find out the truthfulness of those texts. Another one is a philosophical element. You focus on whether, uh, and in the philosophical elements, there are three schools of thoughts. One is very pessimistic that focuses on failure of man. One is very optimistic uh, throughout history, actually. Now, this is not just limited to church history, uh, that man can redeem himself and his work. For example, Marxist, Karl Marx was such a person. And one is a, a balance of these two, that yes, man has failed. There's a failure of the unregenerate man, but in the light of God's revelation and grace, uh, that we can believe for, for a, a optimistic future for mankind through God's revelation and grace. The fourth element of church history is artistic. Now, you may wonder how, and your textbook doesn't go into that. That's something I wanted to uh, focus. You see, it's not only scientific, it's not only philosophical, but it's also artistic. You, you can see the beauty in church history when you find the relationship between the dots when you find a relationship between the events, what caused this that caused that and go on what, uh, moving forward. Um, let me give you one example. For example, um, going back very early in the first century, um, when you have uh, the you know, the destruction of the temple and Jerusalem in AD 70. One question is this, why the Romans attacked and destroyed the temple, destroyed the Jerusalem? Well, well, usually we say that because the, uh, the Jews were rebelling against the Romans. But then again, ask the next question, why? Why they were rebelling? I mean, they could, they, they <laughs> why they waited all these years, and suddenly in the year, year 80, 70, they decided to rebel. Um, we can talk about God's sovereignty, God's plan. We can talk about how Jesus uh, prophesied that in Mark chapter 13, in the Olivet Discourse. These are all true, but there's another element there, which is not against the supernatural work of God. And that is when you read the history, you find out that few years before 8070, what had happened was the uh, 
rebuilding and re uh, you know the um, the repairs of the temple uh, was finished, and that was a big project that took decades to finish. Now, when it was finished, so what you have you have no huge number of people who are not out of job. So you have a labor force <laughs> that is without job, unemployed with labor force. When you have that kind of condition, uh, you have economic crisis. When you have economic crisis, then people are more uh, prone to social and political revolt, revolt. Now, that, you know, some people look at history only from that perspective. Uh, and I think this would be, it's wrong to only look at it from that perspective. I think there's an element of history, there's a, a spiritual elements, <clears throat> but there's also economic and social elements. You have to consider all of them together. Do I make sense? Do you see what I'm saying? Okay, so you, when you see that, okay, well, there was large, huge unemployment, and then there was revolt. Okay, now I can understand why the Romans came and did what they did because they wanted to suppress that revolt. Uh, so it's interesting when you connect the dots, then you're moving, you know, you have this information, you have these incidents. When you connect the dots, you gain knowledge. And when you have knowledge, you can, uh, if you uh, use that knowledge uh, properly in your own time, in your own life and ministry, that is called wisdom. In fact, that's the meaning of wisdom, is uh, uh, using knowledge and uh, uh, in a proper way in different situations. Then it becomes wisdom. See, uh, my goal, my hope is that as we study church history, you'll be able to connect the dots. Ask yourself, why did this happen? Why did that happen? Um, are these connected to one another? When you find the cause and effect relationship, then you can see the beauty, the artistic element of church history. Okay. Um, again, the value of church history um, uh, for us is very important because our faith is rooted in history. We desire to be enlightened concerning our spiritual ancestry. Uh, to follow their good example and to avoid their errors. Um, uh, it, uh, church history helps us to link between uh, factual data uh, and also proclamation for future and application of the gospel. Uh, and through church history, we can gain a far better understanding of our heritage and proclamation of the gospel. Uh, church history helps us to understand the present status of the church. You can read these yourself. I don't want to repeat them. Let me see. Okay. Now, again, these are, oops, uh, the branches of church history. Uh, some, they're, they focus on, they focus on the, uh, political element, the relationship between church and state, society. Some focus on missiology, the mission, persecution, church government or polity, uh, apologetics, uh, uh, practical outworking of the faith practices, and presentation, educational aspect. For example, uh, let me, uh, going back to what I was uh, talking regarding the, uh, the artistic element. You know, many people who want to attack Christian faith and even some uh, um, cultic uh, groups within the Christian faith, they attack the doctrine of Trinity. And they say the word Trinity is not in the Bible, which they are right, but the content is there. Uh, the truth of the Trinity is all over the Bible. But they say, well, it was in the fourth century 
at the Council of Nicaea in 325 that the church decided and wrote about the doctrine of Trinity. And also it was there at the Council of Nicaea that actually uh, you guys, you Christian, put together the New Testament and the Bible. So they want to say this is man-made. Uh, they say, well, if you believed in Trinity and you believed in, you know, these are the books of the Bible, why didn't you do it sooner? The reason, where, again, looking at church history, it helps you to understand, well, something very important happened almost about nine years before Nicaean Creed, Nicaean Council, Council of Nicaea, and that was a man named Constantine, the emperor of Rome, uh, became a Christian. And I, tr I truly believe he became a Christian. Uh, not her, I know there are some people have questioned about his motive, but I, I really think that he was a true believer uh, and he has done lots of good things for the Christian faith. So Constantine become a believer. He stops the persecution and now Christians, theologians have time to sit and uh, systematize and crystallize what they have always believed. And one of them was the doctrine of Trinity. Another one was the canonicity of the uh, books of the Bible. The reason they, first of all, the Old Testament uh, was done at the Council of Jamnia uh, long before that, but uh, the New Testament final canonization in, uh, uh, or actually, initial canonization in 325, the reason was why they didn't do sooner because they were on the run. Uh, they were persecuted. They were running for their lives. They didn't have time to sit have, and have these uh, theological discussion. Uh, so the persecution is finished and now they have the support of the Roman Empire. Constantine helps and pays from the treasury of the Roman Empire to bring all the church leaders together to Nicaea in modern day Turkey uh, and have this meeting. So now they could sit and talk about these things that they weren't able to do it before. And, you know, when you connect the dots, you see how God is working. Um, we talked about, we went over that. Um, you know, another thing I'm getting ahead of myself is it's interesting when you read church history, for example, again, talking about Constantine, uh, you will learn that as his empire was expanding, he wanted to have the second capital in Asia Minor. So he chose Constantinople, the city of Constantine, in Asia Minor or modern day Turkey, that that city is today's the city of Istanbul in Turkey. Now, we may look at this and just pass by it without paying any more attention. But did you know when you go, uh, when we come to the Middle Ages, the main thing that protected Europe and the Western Church from invasion of the Islamic army, the Ottoman army and the Islamic forces was the East Ro Eastern Roman Empire. The Western Roman Empire had fallen uh, in fifth century, but the Eastern Roman Empire lasted until 16th century, almost a thousand years. And if that Eastern Roman Empire wasn't there, the Islamic forces could have captured Europe and God knows what could have happened to Europe. Uh, and then from there also to America, the impact of that on America. Uh, so just think of it, just, <laughs> just one day this guy Constantine gets up and decides, well, I want to have another capital city. So he moves and and uh, plants this city of Constantinople. But all of these are happening under God's uh, um, sovereign rule and protection of his church, protection of the 
Western culture and West uh, and Christianity in the West from the onslaught from the invasion of the Islamic army. Now that's what you find here is where you find the beauty of God's work. I don't know about you, but for me in my own personal life, when I read church history and I see how God's hand is working and moving, it helps me in my Christian life. That as I face problems, difficulties, the Lord that I believe in who can deal with these major international issues, it's far, uh, far more able to deal with my petty problems. Um, so it, it gives me peace. It gives me uh, joy that uh, I'm a part of this great work of God. When you feel, you know, I remember Dr. Woodbridge used to say this to us at the school, at seminary in Chicago. Uh, when you feel lonely, when you feel tired, when you read church history, you remember you are part of this group of saints, this group of uh, believers who have served the Lord, died. Lots of them were martyred uh, and they continued uh, their their faithful ministry for the Lord, and we are not alone. We are part of this larger group. Okay, then their division of church history, um, you know, so for the first century, a spread of Christianity in the empire. Then we had the struggle of the old Catholic church for survival from the beginning of the second century to the beginning of the fourth century. And then the rise of the Roman church. You see, that's another thing. Why did all of a sudden the Roman church gain such a supremacy? You know, where did the Roman Catholic church suddenly came? Did it just one day just drop from heaven and here is hope? No, no, no. There was a process and there were reason for the rise of the Roman uh, church. One of them was when the the Roman government fell under the invasion of the, uh, you know, Germanic tribes, the constant attack on Rome. Well, somebody had to take care of the, uh, <laughs> the problems of people and somebody had to take care of the issues for the city and the region. And there was, there is no institution. The government has fallen. So the Bishop of Rome comes forward and that's how you have the rise of papacy as a king. You know, you know, you have to look at the historical background. So then um, we have from the beginning of four to almost end of the sixth century, the reconciliation with the state and unfortunately worthiness of the organized church and the rise of the Roman bishop. Then, you know, we will go over these things. I don't want to bore you with the, the detail. Then you have the, the constant tension between uh, rise of the empire and Germanic um, uh, Christianity, the threat of Islam, and again, the tension between church and state, the supremacy of Pope. And then... Uh, medieval sunset on papacy and modern time sunrise and we have early reformers that we will talk about them in this course uh, Wycliffe and John Haas okay and the other the modern church history will be in this uh, next chapter next uh, uh, module um whoops on this part Again, if you have any questions, feel free to ask or anything you like to talk more. You know, the contribution of the Roman and Greek culture. You see, three cultures uh, contributed to the church of the Roman, Greek, and Jewish culture. Um, uh, Romans and Greeks, they provided an environment for the growth of the church. Um, you see, this is something very important for the Greek uh, they love debate and discussion about different belief. You know, you read that in the book of Acts uh, about 
the uh, Mars Hill and the discussion of uh, Paul with some of those guys. So when the text of the New Testament uh, were written in Greek, then the they that uh, that just went like a wild fire in that culture because they would love to discuss and talk about these issues. You know, let me just share something here. It's not in your textbook and it's not going to be in your quizzes, but just for your information. It's interesting between the, these two different way of thinking between the uh, Eastern and Western uh, mindset uh, regarding discussion and quote unquote religious writings. In the East, uh, mainly in Mesopotamia and in the civilization that came from Sumer and Akkadian civilization, whenever something was put in writing, gradually that uh, writing would gain some kind of a, uh, like a, a divine uh, importance. Uh, so books that were written down uh, were looked like a sacred books. Now, you may think, okay, well, that's good. They will respect and uh, have a, a high view of books. But, but there was a problem that when a book would become sacred, they would avoid discussing it. And that was completely different from Greek mindset. Greek, they, you see, have you ever, you know, I know, uh, you know, we talk about how God was working in um, Abraham and uh, in the Holy Land. But have you noticed Greeks don't have any prophet? I mean, in Greek history, we don't have, we have philosophers, we have poets, we have writers, we don't have prophets. So, I mean, I know that even if there were some people who claimed that they would be false prophets, not prophets of God, but whether false or true, there is no prophet in the Roman and Greek uh, culture because they wouldn't, like the Eastern people, look at writings in a sense of, they would not assign sacredness to a writing. Um, the Eastern people would do that, but in the West, in that Roman culture, they would talk about this thing, they would discuss it, and that's why the 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 trans the writing of the New Testament in Greek spread so fast in that society. Of course, you know Roman peace, Roman excellent road system, uh, uh, the role of Roman army uh, that provided security protections, and and the fact that you know the Romans were defeating other cultures cause that other cultures lose their faith in their gods. So the ground was becoming ready for the seed of the gospel. And uh, one Roman empire uh, brought this view that, uh, you know, there is a unity of mankind under a universal law. Um, okay, all right. Any questions so far? No? Okay. Uh, Greek culture, uh, Greek language was the universal language and became the uh, language of the gospel. Greek philosophy, uh, you know, the logic of Greek philosophy destroyed the older religions, the irrationality of polytheism, uh, drawing attention to reality that transcends temporal world, and, and they were concerned uh, about the question of right and wrong, and they had they were struggling because they could see their inability to raise to God, to reach to God. Now, keep that in mind. Later on, when we come to the 12th century, there is a movement in church history called scholasticism, which is a fascinating uh, movement that uh, it tries to use uh, Greek reasoning, Greek uh, logic with revelation of the scripture. And you see that, you know, they, they notice the, in their inability to reach to God. 
That's why later on in 12th century, when Christianity was a spread in Europe, the scholastic movement realized that we need, okay, we need, we use human logic, we use human reasoning, but we need revelation. We cannot reach to God only by our own wisdom. We need God's revelation, illumination. Any question so far? Are you guys okay? And even if anytime you disagree with me, feel free to say it's okay. Um, now, the contribution of the Jews, um, well, they laid the ground for monotheistic belief. And uh, let me just say something here, again, from other classes when I teach world religion. Uh, uh, usually, uh, historians or anthropologists who are not Christians, they claim that human uh, race, they were they started with animism and they moved to polytheism from, from polytheism, they moved to monotheism. That's not true. That's a lie that has been sold to uh, us by these uh, secular anthropologists or secular uh, uh, historians. In fact, there are evidences in all cultures, beside the scripture, beside the fact that in the book of Genesis, uh, we read that it calls that the last verse in chapter uh, chapter three of the book of Genesis says, at this time, men started calling on the name of the Lord. The, Now, at the end of chapter 4, verse 26, it says, Then the men began to call upon the name of the Lord. So, men, humankind, started with belief in monotheism and drifted away from it because of sinfulness, because of lies of Satan, uh, all kind of uh, false teaching. Uh, so, it's not that... Uh, you know, they want uh, the secular anthropologists and historians want to uh, force evolutionary theory on everything that they say started with animism and evolved to monotheism. No, in fact, it started with monotheism and it drifted away from the belief in one true God. But one of the great contribution of the Jewish faith, again, these three uh, cultures the Romans provided the so economical, political stability, the Greek, the mentality, and the Jews, the spiritual background of for the Christian church. One great part was belief in one true God. Belief that history is moving toward a point for the messianic hope. History is not just a repeating a cycle we are moving forward and the hope for human race is the coming of the messiah uh, the jewish background provided the ethical system for human society the jewish scripture was the early scripture of the early uh, church the book of psalm was the early hymn book of the uh, early church and the the Judaism give philosophy of history to the church that ch history is moving forward toward the goal to the end that God has designed and the role of synagogues no the role of synagogue is very interesting you see again this is one of the thing that is connecting those doubt dots you can see the beauty of church history when the when the Jews were scattered when they were taken to exile, a Babylonian exile, and they were scattered all around Babylon. And then lots of them, many of them remained. Um, uh, they started forming synagogues. Okay. Now, these synagogues later on became 
the base for apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, such as Paul, to use that, to use these places of worship for preaching the gospel. You look at the book of Acts, you see Paul going to different city. If there was a synagogue in that city, he would go there and he would start from Old Testament and he would start sharing that the Messiah that we are looking for, the Messiah that you are waiting has come and that's Jesus of Nazareth. So again, that's one of the things that, you know, the Jews may, may at the time of the Babylonian captivity may thought, oh, what a, this is terrible. This is dreadful. We are uh, forced out of our land and our, the temple is destroyed. But God used that for, to create these uh, bases, these places for preaching of the gospel later on, centuries later. So, as the book of Galatians says, uh, the word was prepared for the uh, for the coming of the Christ. When the fullness of time came, I believe the fullness of time refers to the impact of uh, the Old Testament on different uh, societies, different human society. Even though they were not converted, even though they were not uh, became part of Judaism or synagogue of their uh, their city, but because of the presence of the Jews and the synagogue, they they and because of their practices, they knew about some things are right, some things are wrong, some things are clean, some things are unclean. So they that provided the uh, the 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 the, the um, fertile ground for the seed of the gospel. Any question? Oh, okay, so let's continue. We come to uh, the, Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. Oops, okay. Even though there has been <laughs> attempt to de deny his existence and, you know, liberals uh, always try to uh, claim that, uh, you know, Christ was only a myth or they wanted to separate uh, the human Jesus from cosmic Christ. These are all, you know, attempts uh, to deny the truth of history. The historic historicity of Christ has been uh, testified from all different sources. The pagan, like the book that I mentioned in the beginning, you know, uh, 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 this guy here, uh, Tacitus, he, in his book, in this book, the early the documents of the Christian church refers to Christ. He said there was a man named Jesus from Nazareth. Uh, his followers called him Christ Christus um, and the savior of the world. We killed him under Pontius Pilate. His followers believed that he rose from the dead and he had a great, wonderful uh, power. He would do miraculous things. And other ones, they testify about the truth of uh, histor historical truthfulness of Christ, uh, different people in these are their time. Josephus, Jewish historian, talks and refers to historical Christ and to many of his deeds. Uh, and then Christian testimony, apart from the Bible, uh, you know, I know apocryphal gospels, I know those things are not part of the uh, Bible, they are not inspired word of God, but nevertheless, they all refer to Jesus that there was such a man. They uh, they uh, confirm the historical uh, truthfulness that there was such a man, Jesus of Nazareth, uh, being Christ, dying on the cross, or rising from the dead. Okay. Apocryphal writing basically are writing that are uh, their authors are unknown or they are of doubtful origin. All right. Uh, character of Christ, one is historical. The second thing, God, man, uh, fully God, fully man, 100% God, 100% man, not 50-50. 100% God, 100% man, one person 
having two natures, fully God, fully man, but having one will. Let's uh, you know there's a dis discussion about whether or did Jesus have one will or two will. Well, let's. I mean, let me say. You know, okay, let me. Let, um, I'm not saying that he didn't have human will. He did, but his human will learned to submit to his divine will. So I'm not denying that he had a human will. So <laughs> let me uh, correct myself. But if you look at book of Hebrew chapter 5 uh, from verse 8 to 10, it says, although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation being designated by God as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. So uh, did Jesus have one will or two will? He had two wills, but his human will submitted, learn obedience to submit to his divine will. Okay. And here, here's a good article if you want to read from GodQuestion.org, monotheism. Do you have any questions here? Any discussion? Okay. Then uh, I talked about, uh, you know, the textbook talks about his ministry mission, the message of salvation, uh, his miracles, his character, uh, meaning God, man, the second person of the Holy Trinity. And let me just share this. You know, that's something very unique about Christian faith. You know, in Islam or in any other religion, you don't have any topics such as Christology. In Islam, you don't have Muhammad Muhammadology. <laughs> or Bud in Buddhism, you don't have Buddhology. Or in whatever religion, you don't have uh, the leader of that religion, uh, to be studied as a separate subject. But in Christian faith, Christology is highly, highly important. Um, in fact, that's the eternal question in Matthew chapter 16, when Jesus asked his disciples, what do people say who I am? And what do you say who I am? And Christ, Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And that's, you see, let me also share this. That's the holy ground. And if you look at church history, if you read that book by Dr. Shelley that I mentioned in the beginning, Church History in Plain Language, he talks about that in one of the chapter. The error, the mistake that at least the early so-called false teachers or heretics did was when they entered that holy ground, when they were presented with the person of Christ, instead of bowing down and worshiping him, they tried to analyze him. And that's an error. You see, when Moses came face to face with the burning bush, and God was speaking to Moses from the burning bush, he told him, Moses, take off your sandals and bow down before me, because the ground that you're standing on it is the holy ground. Uh, that's not a place to try to pick up a, a magnifying glass and see, okay, let me see what's going on here. And this bush is burning and is not consuming. No, you're on a holy ground. And the mistake that number of these early uh, uh, people who are considered as heretic did, uh, I want to say, you know, I don't know, maybe Arius was a kind of a, a, a vicious person. I don't know. But at least a number of the other ones, like Nestorus, other, other ones, they weren't mean, bad people. But that's what I'm trying to say. They made a mistake, and their teaching was wrong. Uh, but the, 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 where they went wrong was that that they try to put the person of Christ, they try to put the, the Holy Trinity 
on their so-called microscope and analyze it. And you can't do that. <laughs> you know, if you read the early uh, creeds of the early church, the Nicene Creed or other creeds, they are not explanation. They are statement. They say, we believe in one God in three persons, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, coexistent, co-equal, co-divine, and all that. This is not an explanation. It's a statement. You just have, based upon the truth of the scripture, uh, we can go to some level in under our understanding of these divine uh, truth, but there's a limit because we are faced with, the, again, something which is beyond our ability. We are at on the holy ground, and the only thing you can do is worshiping, worshiping God. And that's why you can find some of the excellent theology about Christ, about God the Father, about the Holy Spirit in our hymns, in the hymns of the Christian church, uh, not in uh, analytical discussion, even though uh, I'm not saying don't do it, but you know, you remember uh, you are in a, you know, be, uh, you know, be aware of a danger of going too far and trying to force your own ideas on the nature of Christ on the or the nature of the Holy Trinity. Okay. The two central pillars of Christian faith was always his death upon the Christ, the atoning death, dying in our place, and his resurrection from the dead. In fact, you know, again, uh, going forward, this is something very interesting. Uh, there was a theologian, a godly man, part of the scholastic movement in 12th century named Anselm. And he has a very short book called Why God Man? And you see here, you know, I present, I, give, I tell you his argument and you see the fascinating way that the scholastic leaders, uh, theologian, try to use human logic and uh, scripture together. Anselm says, you know, start with this question, why God, man? He says, okay, um, in the relationship between God and man, man is guilty. Man has sinned against God. Man has broken God's command. Okay? So, in order for justice to be done, man must pay the penalty. But, in order, again, in order for justice to be done, the penalty must fit the crime. The penalty must uh, be corresponding to what man has done. Okay, what, what, what did man do? Man broke God's law. Now, God's law comes from his nature, which is infinite. So man has broken something which is infinite. So if there, if there, is, if there has to be a penalty, a proper penalty, it must be an infinite penalty. Okay, are you following me? <laughs> are you? Yes, I'm, I'm following. Okay, Jessica, are you okay? I think I am. Okay, now, the problem is this, that man is not infinite. Man is a finite, finite creatures. Man cannot pay something which is infinite you know what man has what did man do broke god's law now okay if we can put supposedly there's some kind of dimensions for god's law it would be infinite because it comes from god's nature his law comes from his nature so we I, we have broken which is something which is infinite so my penalty must fit my crime i have to pay something which is infinite, but I can't because I'm a finite creature. No, God can do that because he's infinite. Yes, God can pay the penalty. You see, that's where Muslim always go wrong. They say, okay, well, uh, God can forgive us. I say, yeah, God can forgive, but why should he do that? And I mean, how could that benefit you and I? 
because the guilty one, the, you know, even God wants to forgive, somebody has to pay that penalty. Okay, who is going to pay that penalty? Uh, the only person who can pay the penalty must be an infinite being, and that's only God. So only God can pay the penalty. But God is not guilty. Man is guilty. The guilty one, the guilty party must pay the penalty. Man must pay the penalty. God can pay the penalty. So what is the solution? How can we be saved from this dilemma? Who can be, who is the person who can pay the penalty because he's God and who can do that on behalf of man because he's man? A person who is God, man, and that limits your choice only to one person, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus Christ. Cordius Homo, why God, man? That's the logical, you see, Anselm is using Greek logic and scripture to prove his point, which is fascinating. Okay, now, there are these three views of end times. You can look at your uh, chart on chart page 55 and see those three views. Uh, basically, what I'm saying is, if you, it depends on what kind of hermeneutics system of interpretation you use uh, to come with these different interpretation. If you use exegetical, literal, historical uh, um, way of interpretation of a scripture, meaning you use the you study the languages of the Bible in their original language, and you try to draw the meaning from the text. You don't try to force some meaning outside the text into the text, and you look at it literally. Now, I understand that in the scripture there are symbolism. Uh, nobody uh, questions that. But even though symbolism refers to a literal truth. So, when you do literal, exegetical, history and consider the historical background of the text, the only option you will come is a premillennial dispensational view of history. The Amil deny the literal kingdom of a thousand years kingdom, and post-millennial, they, they think that we are in a millennial kingdom now which I would say, if that's the case, that's not very appealing. <laughs> uh, so, but, uh, you know, setting aside all these, uh, you know, okay, I am dispensationalist reform or whatever. If you just look at the text, try to draw the meaning from the text, not from your uh, pre-made uh, theological views, from the text, Try to use exegetical tool. Go back to original language. Use the proper way of hermeneutic, literal hermeneutics, and consider the historical background without being any uh, any without being biased. You come to the fact that there are different dispensation of God's truth, and the only way that you can make sense of out of Book of Revelation, Book of Daniel's or other prophetic texts is premillennial pre -millennial kingdom. Meaning that we are in a period of grace. The Lord Jesus will come in the heaven. Uh, in the, uh, he will, the church will be raptured. And after the seven years, he will come on earth and he establishes a literal thousand year kingdom. And you find the truth of that in the, among the early Christian writers too. This is not something that Darby or the modern evangelical created it. All right. So let's continue. Um, so in chapter three, we have the spread of the gospel first to the Jews 
the foundation of the church in Jerusalem uh, under the leading of the Holy Spirit. Um, um, the Jerusalem ch church, um, you know, was reaching out to the Jewish people. Uh, they were persecuted by Jewish leaders. We have the first Christian martyr, Stephen. Uh, the, it was a... Now, the thing about the Jerusalem church was, yes, it was helping others, but that was temporarily and voluntarily. Um, and if you, important thing if for us to look at when we look at the early church is the preaching of the early church uh, the Jerusalem church in Acts chapter 2, in Acts chapter 17, you see the predominant of the death, atoning death and resurrection, the cross and the resurrection of Christ. A major issue at that time uh, happened at the Council of Jerusalem, and that was acceptance of the Gentile. Now, we may think that's not a big deal. What? Why was such a big issue? Well, there it was a huge issue because the early Christians were all Jewish people and they they taught that uh, this is just an extension of Judaism now to accept uh, non-Jews they taught that they must become a Jew and then they can become a part of the church and the Jerusalem church uh, the council of Jerusalem dealt with that Paul dealt with that he used the example of Abraham that Abraham was uh, considered counted righteous even before circumcision. Uh, and then also you have the significance of destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in AD 70, both as far as the fact that the Jerusalem was no longer the mother church and the center of Christianity and also importance of uh, prophecy, Mark 13. But let me mention that I don't know you ever looked at that if you read Mark chapter 13, the Olivet Discourse, remember Jesus uh, Jesus had his, uh, it happens on the Tuesday of the Holy Week in the afternoon. Jesus had his final uh, confrontation with Jewish leaders and he tells them, you're not going to see me until you say, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. He leaves the church, he leaves the temple uh, with his disciples and it's interesting because you know the, in the book of Ezekiel I think it's chapter 11 Ezekiel see a vision that the glory of God moves away from the temple and settles on the Olivet Mountain Mount of Olive and you know, it's exactly the glory of God Jesus as Hebrews 1 3 tells us leaves the temple and goes and sits on the Mount of Olive and then has that discussion with his disciples, actually a preaching. Uh, while they were going toward that uh, the Mount of Olive, you know, it's the afternoon, the sun is setting on the temple and the temple was beautiful, uh, covered with gold and shining under the sunset. And the disciples ask, wow, look at it, this beauty, this majestic scene. And Jesus says something that just uh, sh shakes them. He tells them, you see all these thing building? The day will come that one stone will not be on another one. It will be completely destroyed. And they were shaken because they thought, okay, we can understand the leadership is corrupt. We can understand the problem with Jewish leaders. But why the temple? The temple is a temple of God. You yourself twice cleanse it and uh, you proclaim this is the house of my father. So why the temple? And the answer is this. You see, Jesus in Mark chapter 13, when he prophesied the destruction of the temple, he was giving them a, a sample because that happened less than 40 years from that uh, time, from the time of Mark 13. Number of these apostles were still alive. Number of, some of them were killed, but number of them were alive. So Jesus was saying, when you see this, that it happens in front of your eyes, that this temple is destroyed. 
then you can be, I'm giving you a, a guarantee. I'm giving you an evidence that when you see what I prophesize about near future happen, what I'm going to tell you about uh, distant future, about the end time, centuries from now, thousand years from now, it will happen exactly as I told you. The, the, as you saw, the temple was destroyed. As you saw, the temple was destroyed. And at that time, uh, when Jesus was talking to his disciples in Mark 13, there was no evidence of a threat of Roman attack or destruction of the temple or destruction of Jerusalem. So Jesus is saying, look, this is a, a guarantee. Jesus, I'm giving you as an evidence, you will be alive, some of you. You will see this by your own eyes. So then be sure what I'm telling you about what happens in the uh, distant future will exactly happen just as I'm going to tell you. And then he starts going throughout uh, human history all the way to the end. Okay, um, so the gospel came to the Jews first. We have in the book of Acts in Jerusalem, the first seven chapters, then the gospel moves to Samaria, then to the Gentile Romans. Then we have establishment of the church in Antioch, which is, again, I don't want to take too much time, but if you read the uh, in either of the gospel, uh, when Jesus was carrying his cross toward Golgotha and he was going to crucify, there was this guy, Simon of Cyrene, suddenly comes to Jerusalem and he doesn't know what's going on. And this Roman soldier just calls him, come, come over here and carry this cross. He became a Christian. He, be he, put, he became a believer. And then he goes back to his country in North Africa, brings his family to faith. And then for the many other, the church is planted in Syrian in North Africa. And many of those people go to Antioch. When you read in the book of Acts, there are leaders from Syrian. And then in the, in the letters of Roman, we read about um, uh, uh, Simon the Syrian, his son Rufus. Uh, that is mentioned in uh, account of crucifixion and also in the uh, Roman chapter 16. So you see, well, it's fascinating. God's working just a you know, guy walks into the city. A Roman soldier calls him, oh, come on, come over here, carry this cross. He comes to faith. Then he goes back to his country. His family comes to faith. A church is planted. A church reaches out to Antioch. And from Antioch, you Antioch becomes a, a sending church for Paul and number of missionaries to Europe, to Europe and to, to the east. They come to Persia, current Iran, Armenia. Uh, Judas Thaddeus was a disciple who did that. India, Thomas, Africa, Mark. Uh, but it's a mistake to use the book of Acts as a blueprint for the church today. Why? Because the church is in a transition and lot and the, the New Testament hasn't, uh, the, the writing of the New Testament was not finalized. The church is in transition and you have to, um, you, you have to wait. Now, we can use the book of Acts, but you have to find the principles behind what's going on and with understanding that it's in a transitory uh, environment and draw principles uh, using proper hermeneutics that can apply to our time. But just taking exactly just uh, uh, direct uh, application from the book of Acts can create problems. Do I make sense? Any question? Yeah, I just want to make a comment. Um, you, you make a good point about that because... Um... A lot of, I mean, I would say like the Pentecostals, for example, um, they take a lot of acts as prescriptive instead of descriptive, right? And exactly. they automatically say, well, if if the apostles could do that, then we can do that now. Um, <laughs> no, yeah. Apostles could do lots of things that we cannot do. Exactly. No, <laughs> I agree. 
Yeah, yeah. All right. Good, good, good. So, and then also not only to the Jews, but also to the uh, Greek. Um, okay, let me make sure it's here. Um, Christian faith, its nature is universal. Um, in a, and again, a major crisis was in Jerusalem uh, with accept, you know, acceptance of the non-Jews that was resolved in Acts chapter 15. Uh, here Paul used the argument that uh, Abraham was counted righteous even before he was circumcised. He, he talks to the Jews that, you know, we Jews couldn't keep this uh, requirement of the laws. How can we demand the non-Jews do that? And the, 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 the prescription in the Acts chapter 15 were only for uh, fellowship between the believers, uh, Jewish believers and Gentile believers. They had nothing to do uh, with anything uh, with regarding salvation or righteousness. You know, don't eat, uh, drink blood, or don't, you know, eat this or or things like that. Um, Paul was a great man in that regard. He was he was a Jew, spiritually Jew, le learned under Gamaliel, uh, legally a Roman, and intellectually a Greek. You see, he had all those three circles of uh, uh, background that affected Christianity: Roman, Greek, and Jews. And his missionary work spread the gospel, his writings, and the principle in his teaching, preaching, principle in Paul's thought is grace and faith, grace and faith. And also he's a great uh, polemist. He argues and because everywhere he went, false teachers followed him, but and he also responded to them. Uh, as I mentioned, he used Genesis 15, 6 to respond to the church in Jerusalem that Abraham believed and was credited to him as righteousness. And later uh, he was circumcised. This happened before he was circumcised. So uh, what we have major Christianity, major centers of Christianity in the first century, you have church in Jerusalem under the leadership of James, church in Antioch and uh, this James is a uh, brother of the Lord Jesus uh, in Antioch under Paul, in Rome originally uh, under Peter, in Ephesus under John, and in Syria under Thomas. Different regions, different individual, and even different expression, but the same faith and the same content. Uh, that's important to remember. So... Again, the New Testament church uh, is based upon the teaching of Christ that says in Matthew 16, 18, in response to Peter, he says, uh, and you are Peter, and I shall build my church upon this, upon this rock, meaning not Peter, but the statement of Peter, what Peter had said, that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Okay, one uh, something about you know um, again about New Testament church. I wanted to mention something. There's a great misuse of Matthew eighteen twenty. Matthew eighteen twenty. It says that for where two or three people gather together, there am I with them. I heard. I am. I've seen so many people misuse that. They say, okay, if you have three people together, we have a church. No, my answer is no. You don't have a church. Uh, uh, they say, okay, well, Matthew 18, 10, 20 says, where, for where two or three people gather, uh, there am I with you. Well, uh, let me tell you, if you're if you are one person, the Lord is with you. Uh, if if all, all, all of us leave our rooms, the presence of the Lord is still here. You have to look at that verse, again, using proper hermeneutics. The whole chapter is talking about church discipline. And it's talking about uh, what the Lord is saying, uh, putting it in simple language. If in a church, maybe a small church, maybe only two or three people want to stand for the truth, want to 
a stand for holiness, don't be afraid. Do the work of the church discipline. I am with you and I approve what you're doing. If it's done based upon the word of God. So Matthew 18, 20 is not telling us what's the minimum number of people uh, that you need to have in order to have a church. <laughs> That's a great misuse of that verse throughout history. Basically, from what we can understand from the scripture and from church history, the requirement for formation of church are these things. It's, it must be a leading of the Holy Spirit. The assembly, no, I don't care, maybe five or 50 or 500 must be born again. No, non-believers can join, I mean, can come, but they are not members of the church. They come so that they hear the gospel and become a believer. In that church, there must be teaching and preaching of the word of God. There must be practice of church discipline, of course, with love, with uh, giving of time. The, the steps of church discipline, Matthew 18, is not supposed to be going like a fast one after another. Um, we have done that in our church, and we have, we take at least one year, one year, to go from the very beginning to the end, because we are praying, we are hoping that the individual may come to his or her senses. And the ordinance, baptism, and Lord's supper must be um, practiced in that uh, assembly. Now that assembly can meet in a building, can meet in a home, can meet in an open field, uh, but there must be these elements together to form a church. I think that's it. And a, I'm sorry, and a godly leadership. I forget about that. Very important. First Peter, First Timothy 3. Yep, that's it. Any questions, anything you'd like to add or you disagree, whatever? I was curious, you were talking about Mark 13 and how um, the glory of the Lord left and went set on the mountain and it just reminded me um of like ezekiel and he was talking about the glory of the lord departing from the temple is there a similarity yes yes in fact that's what i was referring to that in in the book of ezekiel ezekiel saw that so in some sense is a prophetic even though ezekiel saw that literally saw that shekinah glory but also that's been fulfilled by Jesus moving out of the temple and going to the Mount of Olives. Yes, yes. And especially when you remember Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 tells us that Jesus, the Son is the glory of God, the radiance glory of God. Okay, thank you. Sure. Anything else? Okay, guys. Well, uh, I enjoyed talking, discussion. Feel free, if, again, if you have any question, any anything not clear about your assignment, anything, uh, just text me. And also, if, you know, I know sometimes you know, things happen, you get ill, you some emergency happens, let me know, we can work together. Okay. Great, thank you. Great, wonderful. I'm glad to have you guys. God bless you. And let's finish our time with a prayer. Can I ask you, Ruben, to pray for us? Sure. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this time, Lord, that um, we spent today uh, together, Lord. Um, I pray that you bless everyone in this class, um, that you continue to help us through our um, through this time, Lord, in seminary. We know it can be difficult, Lord, um, but we we pray, Lord, that this this honors you, Lord, what we're doing, Lord. Um, I pray that you're with, with us through our study time, Lord, um, to take away any distractions, Lord, that may be um, affecting us while we're studying, Lord. We know we all have uh, uh, busy schedules, God. I, I thank you for uh, Professor, um, the professor that's teaching us this course, Lord, and for everybody that's in this class, Lord. Um, we just thank you, Lord, for this time, Lord. Um, and as I said, I pray that we honor you with our studies, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. God bless you. Have a good week. Thank you. Bye-bye.